This chapter discusses some of the key terms and concepts associated with the AI methods. These are all good places to start to get familiar with what AI is doing behind the scenes and the, uh, the types of processes and, and methods that go into a lot of what we're uh, seeing today with, uh, with AI technologies, particularly for support of planning and analysis. Understanding the AI language and terminology is essential for urban planners because it allows them to effectively communicate with tech professionals, data scientists, bridging that gap between technical execution and practical planning objectives. Familiarity with AI terminology also empowers planners to critically interpret AI outputs, ask relevant questions, and make informed decisions. Furthermore, it enables them to stay updated with evolving AI trends, ensuring their planning approaches remain relevant and effective in the increasingly data-driven world of urban development. In terms of the language of AI, there is, there is lots to know. There are lots of terms and concepts. This shows a menu of lots of the key areas of AI applications that can benefit planners. Machine learning, neural networks, computer vision, natural language processing. I will be talking about several of these in this course, but we'll be focusing on a smaller set of key terms. So one of the first terms that we hear a lot associated with AI technology is algorithm. What is an algorithm? So an artificial intelligence algorithm is like a set of instructions or a recipe that allows computers to process information, make decisions, and perform tasks in ways that we think of as smart. Just as you might follow a recipe step-by-step -step to bake a cake, the computer follows the steps in the AI algorithm to complete a task, like recognizing a face in a picture or translating one language into another. These algorithms can learn and improve over time by analyzing data and adapting to get better results. As you will see throughout this course, a lot of what we use AI for is to detect patterns and use that information in the decision-making process. We frequently hear about algorithms in the context of social media, like TikTok, where we get a particular feed of topics that are really based on our, on our past viewing activity and from others that are similar to us. And so we might hear comments about the algorithm, uh, my algorithm uh, on TikTok knows me better than, say, uh, the algorithm on Instagram. Well, this is based on the models that they have used, the characteristics of the, uh, of the videos that you've viewed, and then taking that information, finding patterns, and making a prediction about uh, what you would prefer because they want to keep your attention uh, the whole time. They want to do a better job of giving you the content that you're interested in. So one simple example of an algorithm is a regression equation used to predict the value of residential property. In this case, we use four independent variables, the square footage of the unit, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, and the lot size to predict what the value of this property would be. The first equation here is the uh, standard nomenclature for the regression equation, which some of you may remember from your graduate planning education days. But then how do we apply this formula to the model that's been generated? We've put in a large set of property value data, the four independent variables with the one dependent variable, and the results of our model 
show that we have a constant of $80,000. And then for each square foot of living space, that's associated with $300. And then for each bedroom, adds another $6,000 to the value. And each bathroom adds an additional $2,000. And then the lot size is taken into account and $100 associated with each square foot of lot size. So let's just apply this to a very, a very simple example where we plug in the values for the square footage of the unit. We'll say a thousand feet with two bedrooms and two bathrooms on a 3,000 square foot lot. This would give us a value of 426,000. We can use this model by inputting new values for the number of square feet, the number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, and, uh, and, and lot size to get a prediction or an estimate for a different unit or a, or a new unit that wasn't included in our original data set. But we've built this model with the data set. We've, we've trained it on, on local data like the appraiser uh, would use. And then we can use this for, for new observations. This is the essence of what an algorithm does. Even though we're talking about regression in this case, which is a simple example, we've fed in lots of property data. The model has learned what those patterns are or what the correlations are between these particular factors and how they're associated with, with property value. And now we can plug in different values to create estimates or predictions on what uh, the values of other properties are. Machine learning is a subset of AI with the ability to learn and improve from experience without being explicitly programmed. This is achieved by using algorithms that iteratively learn from the data, allowing computers to find hidden insights or making predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to perform that task. And in this case, the term learn is interesting because it is closely associated with processing and analyzing like we saw in the regression example. This simple example shows the slope of a line. Um, it's the best fit linear trend line fit to these data points. And it shows us that a dollar increase in, say, parking rates is associated with a decrease in parking demand. This is precisely what we're talking about with machine learning. We've taken these data points, we've discovered what the pattern is, and we're using this linear trend line to generalize what that relationship is between these two variables or characteristics. In neural networks, a neural network is a subset of machine learning models inspired by the human brain. It consists of interconnected layers of nodes or neurons that take in one or more input values apply a function to them, and output the result. Each node in one layer is connected to each node in the next, and these connections have weights, which are adjusted during the training process to optimize the network's performance. This is similar to the general concept that we see with a regression equation. As we saw with the regression model, we had input variables that were used to train the model. Neural networks do the same thing. However, it looks at all possible combinations of the interactions of these variables in order to create the weights that will then lead to a, uh, a prediction. And so in the case of the regression model, 
we have, we look for the one-to-one -one correspondence or correlation between each of the, the input variables and the output variable. With the neural network, the model looks for every possible combination or interaction among these variables in order to find that best fit to the, to the data that's been used for, for training purposes. We don't know exactly what those coefficients or weights will, will look like. And so when we hear about black boxes in artificial intelligence, neural networks and deep neural networks, which I'll talk about next, that's what we're usually referring to because we don't necessarily understand uh, what's happening on these intermediate or hidden layers within the model. These are usually very computationally, very, very intensive because they're looking at every possible combination to find that best fit to make the prediction or estimate. And deep learning. Deep learning is a type of machine learning that uses neural networks like we just talked about with multiple layers, hence that's why we call them deep, to model and understand complex patterns in the, uh, the data sets. Each layer of neurons takes in information from the previous layer, processes it, and passes it on, and collectively these layers enable the model to learn hierarchical relationships. And so, as I mentioned about neural networks, the deep learning neural networks will have these multiple layers, which adds to the complexity of the possible combinations of the weights and biases associated with the input layer or the input variables and how those are connected to the output layer or the predictions or outcomes that are, that are generated. And so these are computationally very intensive because they are looking at all possible patterns. When we compare this to what the regression equation does, particularly for uh, linear-based regression, that is just looking at a straight line correlation between an input variable and the output variable. Here in the, uh, in the deep learning neural network, we can, we can look at really almost an infinite number of possible combinations and shifting those weights so that we come closer to estimating what, that, what those real relationships look like between the, uh, the input and, uh, and output values. Two more important terms that we frequently hear are supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning is a type of machine learning where the model is trained using labeled data, meaning each example in the training data set is paired with the correct answer. Once trained, the model can then make predictions on new or unseen data. That is what we saw with the, the regression model, where we had the input variables and the output variable. We knew, and we, we refer to that output variable as the labeled data. We know what that observation was, or we know what, the, uh, uh, what value or category it was in. Unsupervised learning is a type of machine learning where the model is trained using data without the labels. Instead of being told the answer, the model tries to find patterns or structures in the data on its own, such as grouping similar items together. So in that case, with the, the property value data that we had, we would have the, the values for the square footage, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, and the lot square footage, but we wouldn't know the price. And so in that case, we would be grouping together 
similar, similar properties to see if there were commonalities uh, among them in terms of other characteristics like the value. So this slide shows uh, two different examples uh, with the supervised learning and the unsupervised learning. The first, we know the difference between these two categories and we're able to distinguish them by some boundary because uh, we know these are separate groups. They come from different categories. Or in the unsupervised learning case, we see where they group together and we assume that that group membership um, means something. But it will take a human analyst to go in and look at these, these groups or these clusters to give them a label or give them a name and characterize what that, what that group means or what that cluster is associated with. Also associated with data, we hear about structured data and unstructured data. Structured data is information organized in a specific and consistent way, making it easily searchable and processed by computers as well as humans. Think of it like data in a table or a spreadsheet where each row is an entry and each column defines a specific type of information or a variable like names, addresses, or dates. Unstructured data, on the other hand, is information that doesn't have a specific form or organization, making it harder for computers to search and process. Examples include text or emails, videos, and photos. This slide shows some examples of structured data. And like I mentioned before, kind of a, a uniform structure like in a table format is what we would refer to as the structured data. Each row is an observation, each column is a, is a variable. With unstructured data, that might be a block of text which has no particular variables, has lots of data, but in the form of, of different patterns of, of, of words that are, that are all lumped together. We, don't, we can't break this out in a particular way other than by something like a, like a sentence. Um, but sentences are variable length. Words are variable uh, length as, as well. So there are no standard kind of uniform structure to, the, to this kind of data. Or a picture, which is composed of pixels, um, which are always different, might be different, different sizes, and certainly the pixel colors or depth can, can be very, very different. And in the, uh, the case of pictures or videos on unstructured data is, we don't know exactly where the object is in the, in the picture or the video. That's part of the processing or part of the analysis that needs uh, to occur. Where, again, back to the structured data, we know exactly where to look in order to find a particular characteristic or a particular value. The next is reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a type of machine learning where a computer program, referred to as an agent, learns to make decisions by performing actions and receiving feedback in the form of rewards or penalties. The reward or penalty affects the weight or the likelihood of that action being taken again. The agent is rewarded or penalized with positive or negative feedback based on the outcomes of its actions. Was it right or not? Did it, did it make the correct decision or prediction? Uh, hence the term reinforcement. The reward or penalty affects its weight or basically the likelihood of being used again in the next iteration or the, the next opportunity it has in, in those same circumstances. Natural language processing is a, a very big area of AI. Certainly today with the fairly recent emergence 
of large language models like ChatGPT. Natural language processing, NLP, is an area of artificial intelligence that focuses on the interaction between computers and humans through natural language, like words and word combinations. The goal of NLP is to enable computers to understand, interpret, and then generate human language in useful ways. This involves several tasks, including speech recognition, natural language understanding, and natural language generation. One popular use of natural language processing is sentiment analysis, and that's where we can take uh, comments or text, and then the computer and the algorithm uh, will read that text and look for terms or phrases and then uh, not, not only identify what the topic is that's being referred to, but also the, the sentiment, whether what is being said is positive or negative. So one example could be where we are taking community input about a, a new project. And the information that the resident submitted is, I am in favor of the new park that will be located within the city. It is something we have needed for years. However, I believe the cost to maintain it will be a challenge. And so the, the NLP algorithm will search within these, these sentences and find groups of words and identify the topic as well as the sentiment. Is the person saying something that is positive or is the message negative or is it neutral? Lots of companies are using these today as um, things like uh, service or, or business reviews, trying to get feedback on, on service, customer service and, and other kinds of business interactions. And the volume of comments that they get are practically impossible for one human to completely read through all of them and make some sort of assessment on what's being talked about and whether it's uh, favorable or not. And so we can use the NLP models to, uh, to, to read through this, these vast data sets and help highlight where these different uh, terms or topics or sentiment show up, which can then be revisited by a, a human analyst. Our next term is computer vision. Uh, computer vision has been part of the AI world for a long time. Computer vision is a field of AI that enables computers to interpret and understand the visual or physical world. In other words, it seeks to replicate the process that humans use to extract, analyze, and understand information from images or video. So examples of computer vision today are being used in, in street corridors uh, for counting cars or counting people or looking at the, the interaction among these objects. This can happen for static images and also for video. Computer vision is also becoming very important for what we call reality capture, which is associated with digital twins or a, a virtual replication of urban spaces. And so we can, we can use the computer vision to not only detect what that space looks like, but also put it in a 3D context which then can be used for uh, virtual reality or augmented reality purposes. As we can see, there is, uh, there is a lot to, to AI, and I've really just covered a, a handful of examples 
hopefully that will be helpful for urban planning purposes. The next chapter, I'll be talking about some of the tools and software and common platforms that are used that support uh, many of these methods and techniques.